nothing ever goes away until it has taught us what we need to know. And we've all had the same, learned the same lesson over and over again until one day it clicks. And, you know, I'm the type of guy that has to touch the stove a couple of times to realize how hot it is and fucking, you're looking at the burn and you're like, I'm going to learn this time. And the next day you're touching the stove again. But once it clicks, you really get that feel from the universe, like an internal feeling of, ah, you've unlocked the next level. I, I, I've, I've hit you over the head with this lesson <laughs> 75 fucking times um, it, through different people and different circumstances and different ways. And you keep reacting the same way in this predictable pattern. So I keep giving it to you, whatever God, the universe source keeps setting you up in these circumstances and situations and nothing ever goes away until it has taught us what we need to know. I believe it that never just true. goes away. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Bridge Podcast, your favorite podcast, and I am your favorite host, Sean Nixon. I'm your actual favorite host, Jonathan Matthew. <laughs> How are you feeling today, man? Things are frosty, man. It's almost fall. This is my favorite time of the year. I'm up in Jersey. This is one thing I do like with the Northeast is the, uh, the, the cool weather. That's probably my favorite season. If the leaves yeah. turn down a little bit. Yeah, I'm a fall guy myself. But I feel like I'm going to get fall in the winter and then nine months of summer. Summer, it's yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny because when I lived out in California, like it would hit like winter was like 55 degrees out, but I'd be wearing like a big jacket because oh, yeah. felt, my body just got used to being in hot oh, yeah. all the time. Dude, they You're, say it gets 60 here. I'm like, oh, I'm going to need a full blown fucking. That's a winter. Yeah, snow, snow pants. And <laughs> snow pants for sure because it's fucking beautiful at like 89 every single day, like not too hot. And yeah. then it dips to 80 and the wind blows. And I'm like, motherfucker. <laughs> These motherfuckers told me it was going to be hot down here. Because I'm right. I'm so on the beach. It's not hot and humid. Like people are like, oh, South Florida. It's so bad. Like, dude, I'm in a fucking little cove of <laughs> paradise. Where it's not hot or cold. But yeah, if it gets any colder, I'm going to need a full-blown jacket. Yeah, man. Today, we are bringing you some quotes. that We love quotes. We love speaking quotes and breaking them down to get lessons across. And this is from a very special woman that if you haven't heard of, if you don't know, now you know, um, and you need to look her up. I only know her through uh, John making me aware of her, some podcasts, some internet reading, YouTube videos and stuff. John has actually read some books. We are talking about the great Pema children, um, which I'll leave it up to John to give you a little background um, Info, basically, she's a, a lady from New Jersey who uh, went through her share of adversities, just like we all have, and then had a super rough divorce that sent her traveling east to practice Buddhism. What else you got on the great Pema? Yeah, sure. She's, uh, you know, directly studied with under uh, Trungpa Rinpoche. So if you know anything about Buddhism, he's one of the like main proponents and, uh, te and teachers bringing Buddhism to the West and one of the main teachers. Um, so it's like your favorite Buddhist teacher is teacher, one of those guys, you know? So like, he's kind of like the genesis of a lot of uh, modern Buddhist teachings. So she's from like a Tibetan Buddhist teachings. Um, and so if you, if you see her, she's wearing that Tibetan Buddhist robe and she does a lot of retreat. I mean, see, she's written tons of <laughs> yeah she's done tons of different retreats um and she's like a pretty well-known spiritual teacher over the last 20 years probably even longer than that at least in the u.s um but she's got some some hefty nuggets and she she writes in a really really i think like succinct and easy to understand way and has a couple of key core concepts that she focuses on that are really important for you know, you growing on your spiritual path, or even if you're not spiritual, just your own life path, right? It doesn't life. have to be spiritual, right? It's just life. Yep. Um, That's yeah. why I like it. This is not uh, afterlife shit or trippy psychedelic shit per se. This is life 
lessons here. Yeah, no, this is directly app uh, applicable to your current situation. Absolutely. 100%. I love it. So let's get right into the first one, which is like, you'll see what we meant when we fucking hit the first one because she <laughs> nails it out of the park. Uh, nothing ever goes away until it has taught us what we need to know. And we've all had the same, learned the same lesson over and over again until one day it clicks. And, you know, I'm the type of guy that has to touch the stove a couple of times to realize how hot it is and fucking, you're looking at the burn and you're like, I'm going to learn this time. And the next day you're touching the stove again. But once it clicks, you really get that feel from the universe, like an internal feeling of, ah, you've unlocked the next level. I, I, I've, I've hit you over the head with this lesson <laughs> 75 fucking times um, it, through different people and different circumstances and different ways. And you keep reacting the same way in this predictable pattern. So I keep giving it to you, whatever, God, the universe source, keep setting you up in these circumstances and situations and nothing ever goes away until it has taught us what we need to know. I believe it that never just true. goes away. That's Nicholas no. Cage. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just a side bridge to another spiritual teacher, Wayne Dyer. He brings up a story in one of his uh, pretty well-known YouTube video or one of his lectures he was speaking at uh, about the story of you know, I walk down the street and I fall in the hole. It takes me a long time to get out of the hole. I love this. The next day I walk the street, I'm, the hole is there. I don't notice it, I fall back in. Like the third day I walk, I notice the hole, but I still fall in. <laughs> and the fourth day I notice the hole and I sidestep the hole. And the fifth day I just take a completely different path, right? And so it's like that hole has been there for, what was the whole point of that hole? Is it teaching a different path? And that's what she's saying here is essentially like, and you start to notice it as you get older, right? It's really, it's difficult when you're younger because the first time a pattern happens, it's not a pattern, it's just a single instance. It just has to happen over and over and over again. And that just takes some self-awareness discernment. You can look, you know, relationships, jobs um, are really easy to see this with. Like, I, like you hear this a lot from people, like, I keep falling for the same guy over and over well, again. Well, maybe that's maybe something to you. look into. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's you. What is that trying to teach you? Or like, I keep ending up in the same situations over and over again. Or I keep having the same issues over and over again. You and your old bullshit is the common denominator. Yeah, use well. Let's take a look at that. Like, why is he, why do you think that's happening? Right? Because people don't often question why they just kind of like ah, they just get frustrated and like why is that? It's why is me? Why is this happening to me over and over again? And and like, why aren't you learning like, from it? <laughs> yeah, instead of actually, why? You're okay, you've asked the right question. That's the most Go important. Deeper question. into that, yeah. So you become aware, and you're asking why, but then you're going to fucking pity boulevard instead of down a fucking better avenue to look into it keep asking why and then when yeah. you figure out why you know you don't fix the problem per se you find a new way around it like you say yeah and we'll get into some other quotes where she kind of that, that tie into this for sure so i don't want to go into too much of those but um, yeah let's because this is a quick one and that's a fucking yeah beauty to but not this, start uh, us off but this idea is just really, really uh, setting up for self-awareness, right? That's a big part of just any growth and development, just being aware of, like you said, your own bullshit and all your old nonsense and the things yeah. you've been doing and keep doing. Look for right? the lesson in everything. Yeah. Was yeah. that good ASMR on the mic? Ooh, ah. Uh, oh, scratch a little the beard, The beard scratching? <laughs> it's either driving people crazy or... or you know what I like is those... Uh, you ever seen those videos? It's so weird. Like, you ever seen Kinetic Sand? You know what Kinetic Sand oh, yeah. is? Oh, yeah. yeah, I love it. And those people like cutting kinetic sand. Like, shh, 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 shh. Love it. Like, wow. Like 50 million views. Like, who was watching? <laughs> who oh, was yeah. Over and over again. Over and over, over again. Over and over again. That's a hell of a rabbit hole. See, I'd rather listen to binaural beats than just a bunch of that. Right? Oh, no, of like course. I'm, ASMR barely does it for me. Binaural beats lights me up. Yeah. <laughs> but we're putting it out. Teach their own. Putting it out there. <laughs> um, next one. If we learn to open our hearts anyone including the people who drive us crazy can be our teacher and i think that one's so perfect because instead of hating people and putting them in the box of i hate them it's once again looking for the lesson um everyone is my guru everyone is my teacher um and it's the people that drive you the most nuts that have the most lessons to give you if you're looking for opportunities and lessons yeah and that kind of a lot of um, a lot of the people that drive us crazy, or at least our perception of people that drive us crazy, right? I feel like a lot of that is not all the time, but um, like projection of our shadow onto them, oh, sure. right? And which is why we can't 
that's why they have frustrated us because we can't see what's really going on there under, going on there because it's a shadow i, I don't and like that's, it that's the sign that's like we'll go into the shadow right like i don't want to go in the pitch dark room i was like well maybe what if i could what if i told you that going into the pitch dark room would help you not be afraid of the pitch dark go room, in the pitch dark room you realize <laughs> there's nothing to fear you flip the light on there you go then you just learned what was in there and you didn't have to be afraid yeah and that all the cool thing I like to think about with that quote too is like everyone is, you know, your teacher and guru and you're also somebody else's teacher and guru too, right? Oof. Cause you're being reflected in somebody else and it's, it's, it's a simultaneous, you know, exchange. It's a mutual exchange. Um, Cause we often like to make ourselves kind of like the center point of our whole reality, of which course. we are for the sake of our experience. Sure. Um, but under, kind of understanding that it's a constant back and forth and like, ah, what am I reflecting to them that they're reflecting to me and so these back and forth kind of reaction. Um, that's why when you meet certain people that kind of really spark you up a little bit, you notice what right. is, and then, what and is then in them, a, what's in you, right? A big compliment that people give is, oh, you're just a mirror. You're just my reflection. And it's like, oh, thank you, whatever. It's the same thing Thanks. with a fucking nasty motherfucker when, you, when it's a shadow aspect. It's like, oh, shit. That's the harder part to accept that ah, that's a part of me going on there. I, I don't like. Kind of, huh, interesting. <laughs> ah, uh, interesting. Oh, what they, what, yeah. Why does that person hate me? Like, what do they, don't they like about me that they're projecting? You know, so it's, there's a lot of room for learning, basically. <laughs> We were yeah, if anybody's an asshole or a narcissist or this or that, that's your biggest teacher that you can be grateful for. And it doesn't mean that you don't cut people off. It doesn't mean that you don't set boundaries. It means that you create space and separation to observe and take what you can learn instead of, like I said, when you're putting hate on someone, it's you that feels the fucking hate, not them. Yeah, you're the one. It, it's not, it, you know, it's not about them. It's about what's happening to you when you feel that way, right? Because it's, it's something that exists within, inside you. When you think it's attacking them or hurting them in some way or it's that exchange is going towards them and maybe there is some energetic exchange there, but it's really damaging you mostly. Still doesn't right? help. No. Yeah. Still doesn't serve you. What serves you is learning the lesson and then moving on. I love it. On to Us the next. moving on. Compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Only when we know our own darkness well can we be present with the darkness of others. Compassion becomes real when we recognize our shared humanity. So I really love this because it's just, it's an expanded quote on the wounded healer. And to me, like I said, uh, therapists can talk about this and, and different type of energy healers and whatever. But as a coach and a personal trainer and a strength coach, I would never give somebody an exercise, a corrective, a stretch, anything that I haven't done and mastered well myself because I want to know how that feels. And then I'll take it a step further. The, definite, the difference between compassion and empathy is empathy, you're suffering with them and you're both kind of stuck in the mud. And that is a healing tool uh, for certain times and for certain people where you're both sitting in suffering together to feel the same way. But compassion is seeing them through the eyes of source and knowing that you're not better than them because you're the healer and they need help and you're the helper. Um, it's really quite the opposite. It's I've been there. We're both on the same level um, and looking at them through a lens of love and compassion. And then you have shared humanity of how you can either um, surrender to dissolve a problem or help solve a problem, co-help with someone. Yeah. I think that you can relate that back to the last two two quotes, right? Because when you see somebody who's um, wounded, right? Well, are they wounded or are they just experiencing some sort of lesson that their, that their life needs? And is your role to tell them what that lesson is or to fix them? No, your role is really just to support them because you understand what it's like and you see them for what they are, knowing what you are, right? And that's part of, like you said, I put it really well, like empathy is like suffering with somebody, right? And that's really important, when, especially when someone just needs your support or to listen and to get you in a space sure. where you can actually make a connection to them, right? Sure. Um, versus sympathy. But compassion, I think, is like you mentioned, like a, a little bit more uh, higher awareness empathy version of empathy, right? It's uh, I feel what you're feeling because I know what you are. I know what I am, right? On the, on the deeper level. Um, yeah. That's some heavy duty stuff. Yeah, because you can't read a book and help somebody with their suffering that you've never felt before. And then when you drag yourself into that same suffering, as far as like, Oh, I had a bad day today. It's like, Oh, let me tell you the story of when I had a bad day today. Now we're both going to feel like shit. It's not, it's not even that it's. Yeah. So thanks for making it about you. <laughs> right. That's what I'm trying to say <laughs> is it's your not making it about you. And, you know, like I said, recognizing shared humanity. That's good shit. It's we, we, we yeah, the last bit. Shared shit. humanity. We're, 
and the S is that same, same. We're all, you're human, I'm a human, whatever differences are, are created mostly, right? They're all yeah. kind of boxes. They're like either we, superficial we or up. they're constructs. I yeah. don't really see any like super different, like, oh, this is a staunch difference. The only, the only real difference I see within humans is just the duality of gender, which isn't a bad thing. It's more of a yin and yang balance thing. Yeah, Other the yin yang is part of the same thing, right? And yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So even Perfect. that is still part Even that, of right, thing. is a reflection of... <laughs> Right, because men and women still have X and Y chromosomes, right? They both, or no, they both, or yeah, X facts. chromosomes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the DNA is 99.99, whatever percent. Yeah. Same but I, I'm just saying, I don't see a difference between culture, skin color, any of that. I see, I look for the similarities to recognize the shared humanity. I love it. Next one fear. You know, I love fear quotes. Fear is you know a I natural. Love fear. <laughs> you know how much I love fear. I do, actually. Fear sandwiches. For fear. breakfast. You got to eat a fear sandwich for breakfast because then the rest of your day is fucking rainbows and blowjobs. It's beautiful. You <laughs> shouldn't have fear rainbows all day. Fear is a natural reaction to moving closer to the truth. Whoa. To me, that's the comfort zone, the fear zone, and the growth zone. Do not overlap. Splash zone. <laughs> you got to get in the splash zone. And what it really is, is the only thing you have to fear is fear itself. And that fear is a construct and it's, it's a good tool. It's, it's, it's something to lean into. We can go into all our fear quotes as Joseph Campbell and the cave, the fear cave is where, where, where your fucking favorite treasures at. Yeah. <laughs> to paraphrase. Um, but yeah, what do you think about fear? Cause we know that fear and love are kind of opposite spectrum. A lot of times, at least how we talk about it. Um, and we know that truth is oftentimes synonymous with love. So what do you think about the actual way that it's written instead of me going on a fear tangent, which I can do all day, is fear is the natural reaction to moving closer to the truth. So the way I kind of map that out in my head is fear stems, all fear stems from ignorance, essentially, right? And that's a big part of Buddhism is ignorance is the root of all suffering because most suffering comes from attachment, which is ignorance, which is fear, which is ignorance. Um, and ignorance is really just the direct opposite of truth, right? Of just knowledge and, and truth and wisdom. So because it's the opposite, there's a direct connection, just like the yin and the yang, right? So if fear is a byproduct of ignorance. And by, by that nature, if we're in some sort of ignorance, that means we're not that far away from the truth. We're just like on the opposite side. We're just in a polarity of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of like how you experience that now that, to get away from the philosophical and like the more practical aspect of it, um, the, our, the, our natural reaction to fear feels rational. It's to turn away from fear, right? Or it's to use fear and, and get away. If there's something dangerous, that's a human response, biological response, get the fuck out of there. Right. And that's not, that's important. Like that's a, for survival. Um, but in terms of like an emotional aspect and a spiritual aspect and the mental aspect, that fear, again, like, the past previous quotes is, is there to show us something, right? So going into that fear, we, un we learn to understand our own ignorance and why we're afraid of that, right? And from there, that is the beginning, the spark of kind of getting to the truth and knowledge of, of who we are, is leaning into that fear, right? Being able to stay present with that fear and, and ask why within that space. Because when you ask why to ignorance, you get the truth, right? So I love it. Um, and, and ignorance, and we've talked about this a million times, does not mean you're stupid. It means you're unaware of something or lacking knowledge in a certain thing. Therefore, we are all unaware of certain things. Yes, we're all ignorant on some level. So, yeah. many level on many levels, right? So many levels. And it's just like the quick example that I think uh, I've taken for Peter Crone to just drive the point home is like, I am ignorant to Portuguese because I didn't grow up in Portugal or Brazil. So I'm ignorant of the language. It doesn't mean that I'm stupid. It means I'm unaware of how to speak the language. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's just, uh, you just don't know, <laughs> just That's not it. knowing. Right. So awareness is the first step to knowing what you don't know. And then you can put energy into what you want to know, but you can't just run around, uh, fearfully ignorant all day. Yeah. And I like to use the example of like, uh, if you ever hit, a patch of a black ice or you skid out on the road, you're naturally, if you haven't, it's ever happened to anybody, you kind of know what the instinct is. It's happened to me a couple of times, like in some scary spots. Um, your natural instinct is like, if you start to spin right, is to turn the opposite way, right? It's like, I'm afraid of the spins. So I go the opposite direction. That's your natural gut instinct, right? Someone pushes me, my 
my actual interesting is the pushback. That's where you start to get into judo and you can kind of throw people off balance, right? Um, but the actual way to correct a car if you're spinning out is to go into the spin, which doesn't make sense. It seems like, well, that seems stupid because I'm already spinning that way. But it's the way you correct your wheels and you can actually get back onto the road. You correct yourself. So going into the fear seems like, well, that's stupid. That's silly. That's the opposite of what my body is telling me to do. My nervous system is telling me to do. But it's the way that we can kind of correct ourselves to, okay, well, what's actually happening here? Like what's really going on here? Um, so that's always a helpful visual for me, at least. I love it. Perhaps that's all we're trying wrong. to get to is our truth. Oh, yeah. And a lot of times fear stands in the way. Yeah. And it is the way, right? <laughs> ah, ah. It is the way and you can't avoid the fear. That's exactly right. I love it. We'll next, next one is to be fully alive, fully human, and completely awake is to be continually thrown out of the nest. And I think this is a perfect order because not only are we fucking professional podcasters, but it goes along with the fear of, so the metaphor of being thrown out of the nest is like a baby bird has to fly. They could, the baby bird's fucking spoiled, right? They could sit in their <laughs> comfort zone, sitting there. Getting Mama dropping food in their mouth. <laughs> literally spoon fed. The, the mom is not only spoon fed, chewing it up so it's partially digested and spitting it down their throats. That's real love so right they there. are super cozy, super comfy. But the mom knows, hey, I got to put them through some fear, some challenge. The mama bird knows. They're going to be an eagle, zone. bro. You got to learn how to fly. That's learn part of the, one of the main parts of being a bird is uh, That's it. And flying. that's one of the main parts of being fully human in, in her, mm. right? To be fully alive. And I like how it also says completely awake because there's a lot of people in uh, uh, that are awake and aware of the matrix that we live in of government corruption and all the nonsense going on that are not awake to certain things and are ignorant to certain things. So it's not that someone's better than someone else just because they're trying to either wake you up or educate you on something or um, clear your ignorance of something, but to be completely awake is to be continually thrown out of the nest, meaning testing yourself, getting out of your comfort zone, facing your fears and continuing to grow. Yeah, I mean, the only way to learn, you can't learn, you can't fly without have, experiencing the fear of falling, right? Like, you can't, that's the, the way birds fly is they literally get, if you ever watch some Planet Earth stuff, like, oh, they really just, you just fall. And then, like, you just trust yourself to take over and the, wing, the wings pick it up, you know? When you're ready, you're ready. It's kind of one of those deals. But you have to be willing to take that little leap of faith into the unknown, right? Ah, that's literally ah. what it is. That's literally what it is, leap of faith. That's not yeah, and that's and that happens over and over again. It's like um, you just you continue because like in the quote, she's just continually getting kicked out, right, of the nest oh, over yeah. and over and over again. That's what happens. You get comfortable flying, there's a new nest to get kicked out of, right? <laughs> yeah, once you get comfortable in life, like I said, the comfort zone and the growth zone do not overlap. There's a fear zone in the middle, and when you're brave enough to face the fear, that's when you get into growth. But then you're chilling in your growth, and you've gotten to a new level of this game that we call the human experience, the game that we call life. And then you get comfortable again. And to go to the next level, you have to face more fears, become more uncomfortable, learn new things, um, and then grow to the next level. Continually to be fully yeah, baby. alive. And a big part of that is like, you gotta be a baby bird over and over and over again, right? So yeah. like, that's part of like the fear of starting something new is like, you feel like a beginner and you're gonna suck. Well, yeah, it's being a baby bird, right? Like. Someone's going to have to vomit in your mouth so you have sustenance. But when you're ready, you'll you be able take to fly. The leap of faith. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Next one. Only to the extent that we expose ourselves over and over to annihilation can that which is indestructible in us be found. Okay. So once again, we got these in a great order because we are the greatest podcast in the history of the world. But ex I like how she says exposing ourselves to annihilation to find what is indestructible within us. So once again, to me, this is another one. Her overlying theme from my perspective is letting go because she, like me, held on to old things, old people, old relationships, good and bad, like uh, traumas you hold on to, but then people and things that you love that are no longer with you, you hold on to. And either one of those things are attachment. So this to me is a beautiful quote uh, for letting go. Yeah. I mean, part of the, of, um, you know, one of the major parts that we all have issues to become so attached. Right. And this reminds me of, to what we think we are. And this kind of reminds me of, uh, kind of, uh, yoga, essentially one of the teachings of like Jnana yoga or 
uh, Vedanta, which is like non-dualism, is like you continually identify what is not it, like what is not in- infinite, right? What is not truth? What is not God? That's how you, you destroy everything that's not it to find what it is, right? Yeah. Think about kind of like chipping away at like a, like a mining, right? You're mining, you're chipping away at rock. Everything that's not gold until you hit gold, right? Oh, so okay. it's all kind of within that whole, that whole structure. But this continual annihilation is, again, that's also late. Like, again, we're kind of uh, bridging back here, but that jumping out of the nest is a, is a sense of annihilation, right? Like that's, you're facing imminent death, but in the imminent death, you experience the now you can fly. sensation of flying, right? The, the infinite nature of just exploring the entire world, right? With wings. Love it. Um, now you're indestructible, which builds more confidence. You know, you face your fear. Confidence is not a thing that is given or inherent. It's what you earn by facing your fear. Yeah. Over and over and over and over again. Over and over and over again. Yeah, I, I like the word just too, like annihilation, like complete and utter destroying of who you are. And then if we get into psychedelics, you could talk about like an ego death experience, right? We literally identity is just completely destroyed. And it doesn't need to be a psychedelic experience. A lot of times they're just life experiences. Like you lose your job that maybe you identify with. You lose a relationship, which you identify sure. with. You lose financial security, your home, right? All that challenges your, it makes you question like, well, who am I? Was I really all that? Maybe not. Maybe there's something more there, right? Maybe there's something indestructible. And again, Victor Frankl, which we always go back to, right? Everything can be taken from like a man, right? Like everything can be destroyed except that one last little bit, right? Um, Talk more about psychedelic journeys because sometimes you physically feel like you're being ripped apart and put back together stronger. Yeah, I feel like there's a movie I'm, in my head I'm trying to reference where this happens, but... um. Um, maybe it's, maybe it is Dr. Strain. No, maybe it's something else. But, um, but yeah, like in a couple of the experiences, you know, one of the, one of the deeper ones, you know, it's really the sensation of almost being kind of torn apart atom by atom and being put back together. It's like, it's like, <laughs> that's a little bit of like phasing is in Star Trek, where your atoms just get ripped apart and put back together. Um, it's like literally the essence of your being, especially if your physical body, we're all very attached to this your idea, your identity, like my name is this and I'm from here and I do these things and I sound like this, right? And it's all, again, layers and layers and layers of constructs and labels that we've given ourselves out of security, out of attachment, that when destroyed, we're kind of like lost, right? We feel lost because we don't know where the space is to not have these things be who we are. Um, Yeah. Yeah, but that ripping apart, coming back together it's a very visceral experience but it's it's almost it's almost freeing you realize that ripping apart actually like opens you up to being more than just what you were that's what one of the major um i don't want to say points but like benefits of a psychedelic medicine journey is to annihilate your ego and who you think you were and now it's like but there's so much more it's like it, it 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 kills you meaning like an ego death of ripping down this false structure of belief system that you thought you were within the matrix. And then it shows you, but you can be everything. And that this is what you actually are. And this is what you actually are. are. But then it's like, okay, but you want to play this little silly human game. I'll put you back together in a couple hours and we'll see how you feel. tomorrow. <laughs> and then the next day you're like, Whoa, I could totally still be that old fucking person. But like, now I know I have limited limitless potential. Yeah, it's you, been come, you come back into it in a much different way, right? You come back into your uh, identity. You get put back together and you maybe look the same and sound the same and have the same name or whatever like that, but you're entirely different on the inside because you, you're aware, right? Of what's you're aware your perspective has been shown. Some new shit has come to light, dude. I'm having dude stuff. <laughs> I love it. So here's my last one uh, that I absolutely love my lucky number seven here. Someone I loved once gave me a box full of darkness. It took me years to understand that this too was a gift. That goes back to the, everybody is your guru. Everyone is a teacher and everything is a lesson when you're looking for it. And this one isn't one to fucking unpack too much. This one's just for everybody to chew on and swirl around, swirl (laughs) around the glass a little bit. Waft, Waft a little bit. in the aromas. Get the bouquet it, of that quote. Swish it around a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, a, someone that you love gives you a box full of dark. They fucking put dog shit. Life in is your like heart. a box of darkness. <laughs> it is. You know, because you never know what you're going to get. 
And it took her years to know that that was a gift too. And when you put that into your own life uh, situation of like, oh shit, someone that I fucking held on to and loved pooped on my fucking heart. And then instead of sniffing poop all day and, and hating them, I can fucking understand that that was a gift. And there's so many lessons in that box of poop. Yeah. The darkness, the void, right? Like it seems like a, bo- a box of darkness, right? It looks, feels like an empty box, but in, we think of emptiness as being a negative thing, but emptiness is really just space, right? And she mentions that having that space to really explore the depths of ourselves is a gift, right? Heavy we're duty. constantly giving people and people are giving to us. We don't even realize it. It's always happening cons- continuously. But chew on yeah. that. Yeah. Just yeah, don't, uh, don't think too hard about it. Feel, feel into it. Listen no, no, no. to it. You could do, you know, we could give you some uh, fancy hippie term of meditate on it, but I really think the meditating on this one is just read it and breathe in and see how it feels and where it resonates with you. Yeah. In your own uh, personal experiences. I see it. What else you got? I, that was my seven. I'm sure you got a couple of more. Cause like I said, you uh, introduced me to her. Um, yeah. I've read a couple of books of her. What, um, throw out some titles. Cause they're worth uh, recommending to the audience. Yeah. That's, Cause we have a hungry audience for book recommendations we do. Um, <laughs> that have either read a ton of shit um, and are looking for new shit or people that are new to the spiritual game, quote unquote. Um, and I only remember the one, uh, when things fall apart, is that correct? Yeah, that was the first one I read. So when things fall apart, that's one that's of her, the only one I know. And I started on audio. Uh, yeah, it's one that's of her one earlier of my, ones, but I think it's one of like a, a couple of ones you mentioned are from that book. Like that one's a, that's a big one. That's a big one. Um, and then start where you are. That's the other one that I read. Ooh. So that's another really good one. She has like dozens Sneaking of Sneaking the quotes right in the title too. I know. <laughs> when things fall with, apart. Comfortable with uncertainty. Ugh. Welcoming the unwelcome. Living beautifully. Yeah. Come on now. Like <laughs> this is not Alan Watts where it's a fucking pretzel wrapped inside a riddle, wrapped inside dog shit, wrapped inside gold. Next thing you know, it was a fucking edible brownie the whole time and you're fucked. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah. What yeah. did you just say? That was so profound. And now I left more confused. Like, she's just like, no, when things fall apart, what are you going to do now, motherfucker? Yeah. Let me give you my perspective. She actually says that in one of her books. What are you going to do now, motherfucker? Yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, so speaking right, of so things what, fall apart, this is yeah. the one quote that I really like. And I feel like it encapsulates a lot of her, uh, her teaching. Um, <clears throat> things falling apart is a kind of testing and also a kind of healing. You think the point is to pass the test or, or to overcome the problem. But the truth is that things don't really get solved. They come together and they fall apart. And they come together again and fall apart again. It's just like that. The healing comes from letting there be room for all this to happen. Room for grief, room for relief, for misery, and for joy. So I think that one is... Uh, That's heavy duty. How does that hit you? <laughs> so that one hits me fucking smack dab in the feels. Because I got sucked into two ends of polarity on this, meaning my entire life, younger life, I was sucked into the deep darkness of depression and literally every thought that came in that I fed energy was negative and I was just in a depressive hole of self-destruction, physically, mentally, emotionally, and otherwise, um, where I just leaned into everything darkness and everything negative. So then when I gained a little bit more mental um, awareness and strength and power and better mental health, I kind of went too far the other way and went super Mr. Positive on everything. Um, and I built a strong wall, um, literally a brick wall around the heart chakra and walls up on certain people and specifically myself. Cause I was like, okay, I'll solve this with fucking logic and and no emotion. And I was like, if everything sucks that I feel, I'll block out all feelings. And so where it hit me in the feels was she says, leave space for what is it? Grief and joy and relief and um, anger at the same time or something like that. Room for grief, for relief, for misery, for joy. Yeah. The misery and the joy, the grief and the relief. You got to kind of let it all in and then learn to alchemize it up to a higher vibration and turn it all into love. But the first step of feeling everything and leaving space for everything is huge because that's where I'm at currently and that's what I'm working on currently um, is letting everything in. Because like I said, if, if everything seems dark, 
you can't have darkness without light, right? So I put up the fucking curtains to not let in any darkness, but that's not letting the light in either. Yeah. So I got to leave a little space for everything. And that's the waters that I'm currently navigating. Um, Cause I, 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 step by step, if you want to break it down, I learned how to love myself and I'm on baby steps of loving others. Right. And I'm getting there and I'm like, Oh, that's everything. I know what I'm doing. And then it's like, Oh no dog, you got to be able to receive love as well. <gasps> and I'm like, ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like you, you mentioned, I think this is an important thing too. Cause like, you were like extreme negative and like, again, like that gut instinct, and I feel like we've all kind of done this at some points to go extreme positive. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's like a bad, yeah, but I don't think that's necessary because like the, what, what's the alternative is to go more extreme negative, right? Which would oh, be yeah. awful. And then you right? so, the game and I would not recommend that for anybody. No, no. So I think that's like, um, and we probably both seen with a lot of our clients and definitely with ourselves, but I think that's a really good kind of like stepping stone. Cause like what it does at least is it, at least it kind of reintroduces you to feeling good again for yourself again. Yes. Right. Um, because, and so to while it's possible, yeah, while it's still not the entire thing, it's definitely away from the thing that was going to end you completely. Right. So it's like a really, I think a really positive, cause you also became way more fit and way more healthy because like all those things led to that. Oh, so yeah. like plenty of positives came from that. But you say that yeah. all the time, you got to go too far one way and too far the other way to find the middle. Exactly. Right. You, the pendulum swings back. So then it settles in the middle. Right. Um, yeah. What and, does this one mean to you? Yeah. Relating back to the, to the, the, the box of darkness, right. Um, just the leaving that last bit, like he, the healing comes from letting the very room for all of it to happen. Um, because so much of us, all of us, we want to feel and enjoy all the positive things of life. And it's really, it's really tough to stay in there and hang in there with all the, the, the shitty stuff. Right. We really don't like it. You know, we, we want to, we wish we could kind of just like, like in click, right? Just like fast forward through all the negative stuff. And we can only experience the positive stuff. And if you've never seen that movie, I highly recommend because you'll learn some lessons <laughs> if you do if you do that. Bring your tissue you. box to that one. Yes, too. bring your tissue box. Um, that first part, Things Falling Apart, which is the title of her book, is a testing and a kind of healing. Um, and I think that really challenges our kind of like social construct that we have now where it's like, because it's very logic based. It's like, I'm going to overcome this problem and the next problem. And again, that can be like a positive thing when used, when, when applied appropriately, right. With higher awareness. But if like, that's, if you think you're getting done or you're overcoming the thing, like it just, it's a constant happening. Like things are always falling apart. Like there's never going to be a perfect anything, right? Not doesn't mean you don't strive to make things better or to make things as perfect as they could be, but with the understanding that things are going to always fall apart, like a sandcastle getting, you make a beautiful sandcastle as amazing as you want it to be and you enjoy the experience of it and you love it and you put effort into it, but you know, it's going to get washed away. That's just what happens. That's what the ocean does. Right. And so that doesn't mean That's you don't build sandcastles anymore. Right. It doesn't mean you hate sandcastles because they all, they all die or they go away. It's like, no, well just for one, it makes you appreciate them more. Right. It more. makes you have more gratitude for like, cause you know that they're temporary. An, yes. This is going to last an hour. And like, I know it's just what happens every time, but I still love doing it, you know, and I still like making it, it means a lot. And so apply that to the areas of your life where, you know, things are tumultuous, right? And you're afraid of things getting ripped away, whether that be, again, a job, relationship, house, money, security, life, world circumstances, right? As they are, right? It's really easy to, again, only experience the grief and the misery, right? But you got to leave space for the happy things too, but also leave space for the negative. Because once you know the polarities, you can really experience them much more in a much more aware space and you can find that middle way of Buddhism, of yoga, yeah. of Taoism, right? So. Boom. Yeah. That's what we're doing. And that's where I'm at. I'm looking for that balanced middle way. And that's a constant Love thing, it. right? Like balance yeah. is never like I'm done. I'm, I'm balanced. No, like balance is a verb. Like to balance is a verb. It's constant. You're active in doing it. Um, what do you got next? Next one I'm going to pop into. Um, not causing harm requires staying awake. Part of being awake is slowing down enough to notice what we say or do. The more we witness our emotional chain reactions and understand how they work, the easier it is to refrain. It becomes a way of life to stay awake, slow down, and notice. So much there. Slow down. It's like That's light spidey so, senses. Yeah. So <laughs> slow down gets us out of that go, go, go rush mindset. The future mindset, um, right? What is the last line? Last line is, um, it becomes a way of life to stay awake, slow down and notice. Notice is like 
observation. And she mentions awake a couple of times. So that is just ebb the whole game to play the game properly. You have to slow down and be the observer. But so yeah. much in that one. Yeah, if you're going too fast, going too fast is a result of always being ahead, being in the future, right? So slowing down really gets you in the present moment. Like, well, that's why time flies when you're like really immersed in something, right? Because things slow down your perception, but the world's still going as it is, right? And vice versa. Um, and the first part, like not causing harm too, right? Because when we're constantly going, we can sometimes become like a, like a bull in a china shop, just like not knowing what we're doing, just emotional reactions and like things triggering us and they could cascade. Um, and that's, just, and that's just going to happen, right? Like that's just like things trigger you. It's, it happens. It happens to all of us. Right. And you said cascade, which is a great word and her phrase of emotional, uh, ch uh, chain reaction is chain reaction, fucking yeah. beautiful because boom, when boom, you boom, realize boom, boom. that it's literally a chemistry chain reaction and that's part of this human experience game too if you want to talk about enlightenment and ascension and blah, blah 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 and spiritual growth is recognizing that chain reaction and the fact that you can alchemize those vibrations into higher uh, frequencies for your own benefit and by noticing them and not reacting off of old patterns and instinct but becoming the observer and being aware of those emotional patterns and then like you said you can ask why or where does it come from or how does this serve me or what am i doing to others and am i beating myself up and not to fucking ramble like that as far as like over analyzing and overthinking and asking too many questions yeah. but when you slow down the answers come to you yeah when you're going too fast you're always trying to chasing something right when the universe is trying to give it to you. You're just going too fast for it, right? Like <laughs> you got to slow yeah. down enough to, to see it. Right. Um, and um, like, I, you know, like what you said too, like this emotional chain reactions can be like triggering. And it's part of it. Again, it's like our biological systems, like our nervous system response. And part of understanding that is being aware of that for one. Um, but also like, and she meant, like we talk about compassion in our other quotes too. It's like, having compassion for your your emotional reactions like whether they be out of ignorance because like you're a human being right like this ah. is what happens like have compassion don't beat for yourself. yourself up yeah don't beat yourself up what why did this happen let's 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 learn from it right let's study it a little bit notice um so yeah not causing harm last two these are kind of chunky ones but um second one i'll go with is to stay with that shakiness to stay with a broken heart with a rumbling stomach, with the feelings of hopelessness and wanting to get revenge. That is the path of true awakening. Sticking with that uncertainty, getting the knack of relaxing in the midst of chaos, learning not to panic. This is the spiritual path. Getting the knack of catching ourselves, of gently and compassionately catching ourselves is the path of the warrior. We catch ourselves one zillion times as once again, whether we like it or not, we harden into resentment, into a sense of relief, a sense of inspiration. That's a big so one. good. Yeah, that's the path of the warrior for sure. The spiritual warrior, the military warrior, the metaphorical sports coach or athlete warrior, they all got to be able to observe what's going on and not panic and make the best decisions when the chaos is going off. Yeah, like and I, that's that's like the, that's the perfect, you know, the reason we the reason we are also drawn to superheroes is like sure they have cool powers, but it's the fact that they're so res like calm and collected and ready in the face of just complete and utter destruction. We like there's part of us that really admires like admires that. We see, so we see that in sports, we see that in the military, we see that in real life everyday heroes, or in the the archetype of you know the, the warrior, best the hero. Men and women are the same shit. Like oh my god, this happened, this happened. It's like okay, what do we do now? Let's yeah. calm down. Yeah, and that's decision for the team. Yeah, and staying and she said staying with that shakiness, right? Like part of staying with that shakiness is accepting that the shakiness is going to happen no matter what, like it's going to happen. You can't control every aspect of your life. It's going to happen. That's part of being pushed out of the nest. Where's that shakiness? Now what? Right. Yeah. The shakiness is inevitable. So you can't panic every single time because then you're kind of just wasting time and energy before you can get right to the, I don't want to say solutions, but I, 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 anytime somebody comes to me with a problem, I'm like, don't come to me with a problem. Come to me with a solution. Like, let's, let's get right to the fucking meeting. With your fucking let's problems, huh? <laughs> you come to me with your fucking problems. <laughs> Day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> exactly, right? Come to me. Um. <laughs> Make them an offer you can't refuse. Side note, the, 
uh, Sopranos movies coming out. That looks pretty ridiculous. I haven't even oh seen the Sopranos. So it looks ridiculous. <laughs> oh, bro. Dude, well, first of all, it's my Which favorite. Which I have to watch the whole thing to go back and see the I movie. I think you should because I'm sure that this is a prequel. Type. It is a prequel. It's him as a kid, which is wild. Uh, which is what the whole show is about. His childhood. About, uh, yeah, bro. Because the whole thing is he's a tough guy, mafia boss. Tony Soprano. He's not supposed to cry about his problems. So every Tuesday, he gets like three different drivers, sneaks into three different back alleys, goes through a thing to see a therapist because nobody can know. Or he'd be making fu- make, made fun of, extorted, like everything. Um, but the therapist gets to the root of all his problems are obviously some daddy issues, but major, major childhood mommy issues. Mm. And all the time he's sitting on the couch talking to this lady, he's like, you don't fucking know shit. Don't tell me about problems. You don't know my fucking problems. And she's like, okay, and then well, tell me a story then. Well, when I was when I was eight, this <laughs> happened with my fucking mother, and this happened. And and then he's fucking crying and he throws the fucking desk and he's like, And you fucking got me to this point. Talking about my fucking mother every fucking Tuesday. I pay you for this shit. And it's like, yo, he's like, dog, slow down. The lesson is right there. And he figures that, you know what I mean? He learns a lot and he, yeah, yeah. he apologizes like 97 times for flipping out because she brings it to the surface. Of remember when you were eight and your dad fucking slapped her around and what what did you feel then? And then fucking boom and it brings it to his yeah it brings it to the surface that's the way you put it. like <laughs> that's just rising up <laughs> oh man I don't know how we start I get dude I could talk Sopranos all day I don't know how we got on there but yeah what are we um, talking about yeah uh, the movie yeah, I mean, coming up yeah the movie yeah <laughs> so that's a good quote um a and good, great quote we got one more and this is a grand finale yeah last one. From this point of view, the only time we ever know what's really going on is when the rug is being pulled out and we can't find anywhere to land. We use these situations either to wake ourselves up or to put ourselves to sleep. Right now, in the very instant of groundlessness, is the seed of taking care of those who need our care and and of discovering our goodness. Huge, huge. Once again, she mentions awake or asleep as a metaphor of so many times because the once again the rug being pulled out and the shakiness is inevitable so it's what are you going to do then are you going to go back to your comfort and go back to sleep and ignore the problems in the world in the like i said government corruption matrix stuff but more importantly the internal your shadow aspects and the shit you're working on um what are you going to choose because the 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 rug being pulled out is the inevitable part you choosing the light or choosing the dark or choosing to go back to sleep and ignore it or awaken and grow up and take care of and take personal responsibility for your shit. And that's your choice. Uh, talk to us about groundlessness. Yeah. That's one of, if you if you start to read her books or look into her or listen to her, or whatever, that's one of her primary teachings. And it's this, um, and it piggybacks off a couple of things from her last quotes, right? This, um, things falling apart, being pushed out of the nest, this, never being able to fully settle into comfort, right? Like that's what we all kind of want as biological human beings. We want to be safe, comfort, stay the same, no change. You know, the same things is good. It's constant security, right? That's like a biological response. And this, this idea of groundlessness is something we resist, but again, it's where we can really find, that's that space of not knowing where to land, not being certain, not being staying that really, forces us to be aware, right? We were talking about like the cold weather, like the cool weather. I like the cold because when I used to like, when I first started, I was really, really depressed in college and didn't know anything about anything. Like I just kind of like accidentally discovered like cold therapy, like for the mind. Cause I would just like go out there to like, it would force me to like not think. I just had to be entirely present with my body. I had to breathe. Like this helps me not think about all the bullshit. Like I'm being entirely present. Like that's a, there's a sense of groundlessness. Like I'm not secure. I'm not warm but I'm really present. Like, you know, and that's, that's the trade off there. It's like, I'm not secure, but I'm really present and really, really aware. And you can't really help somebody from a sense of security because you're sacrificing awareness when you're really aware. And like you said, of things beyond more things that you realize, the more aware you become, the more people you can help. Cause that's what it's really all about. Right. Um, And what you can do for other people and discovering how important and how powerful you really are to help other people. And those are both really amazing things. Right. Um, and that's feel like we're all the, all the crazy, cool psychedelic stuff for all, like the, like you said, the Ascension stuff, really, it's all just about helping other people at the end of the day. And that's what Pema's done with so much of her life. And that's what we're trying to do and, and help you. And, you know, 
you guys are helping us all the time. And it's, it's, it's great. It's fantastic. So I love it, man. Yeah, man. That was a beautiful <laughs> way to end it. Let's uh, wrap this shit up. And like I said, uh, look into Pema for sure. Uh, quotes, audio books, podcasts, YouTube channels, and then the books are yeah. worth the read. We'll throw some book club recommendations out later at some point. Highly <laughs> recommended. <laughs> All recommend. right. Brush your teeth. Say your prayers, eat your vitamins. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Peace. Mm-hmm.